Good evening. My name is uh, Pierre Soris. I'm a lecturer on the MA in Contemporary Art at South Lewis Institute. And welcome to the fifth uh, artist talk that we uh, organize, um, South Lewis Institute and uh, SOAS. We started with, uh, in February 2018 uh, with, uh, when we invited Lydia Urhaman uh, to talk about her practice uh, here. And since uh, Alfredo Jarre, uh, Zarina Binji, and uh, Hassan Moussa uh, came and uh, talked uh, to us, the idea is to uh, give the opportunity to artists uh, to talk about their practice. It can be on the occasion of an exhibition or just for them like, to talk about their art. Tonight, we are uh, very uh, happy to have uh, Kudzanai Violet uh, Wami, uh, who came uh, here. Um, she's very busy. It's been a very uh, busy year uh, for her. Uh, she uh, is having a solo show at uh, Gasworks uh, in London, still for a few days or a couple of weeks. So thank you very much, Cousin Violet, uh, for coming here to talk about uh, your art. Um, uh, Cousin Violet's works were also uh, part of the, um, uh, the show at the Zimbabwean uh, Pavilion at the Venice Biennial uh, this summer. And um, to talk uh, with her, we invited uh, Sabel Galvadon, who is a curator at uh, Gasworks. Um, I believe uh, Sabel is um, engaged in quite adventurous curating, shall we uh, put it uh, like that. Um, and um, three years ago, you uh, organized an exhibition that uh, was held in Madrid and in Mexico City about uh, performance, about radical performance. So thank you very much, Sabel, uh, to come uh, uh, tonight. Thank you. <laughs> After the conversation, uh, um, we will ha you will have the opportunity to uh, ask questions. If you like, there will be a discussion. So please uh, feel free like, to keep questions uh, for the end of this talk. And then we will have uh, drinks served in the cafe downstairs. Up to you. Hello. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, is this working already? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it now working? Oh, yeah. So um, I was just saying that I thought to begin this conversation, maybe we can talk a little bit about the ideas and the experiences that inspired uh, Violet's new exhibition at Gasworks, and specifically the residency that Violet, um, that you undertook at Zimbanete in Harare, and, and how confronting certain romantic notions about this idea of going back home, of homecoming, how has affected your painting, what are kind of the experiences and ideas that you were entertaining during the production of this new body of work, which you can see in the slideshow. Before, before uh, uh, kind of finishing that question, I will just say to the audience, in the images that you see here, it's uh, mostly uh, works that Violet has produced for gas works, but at the end of the slideshow, there's like five or six images of previous work just uh, for reference because we'll be, we'll be talking as well about what has changed or evolved in Violet's practice over the last uh, few years. So maybe, yeah, if you, want, if you want to talk a little bit about that, Violet. Uh, I want to say, first of all, thank you for coming tonight and uh, really appreciate it. Um, before I, when I went to Zimbabwe in 2018, the idea wasn't to have an exhibition right after that. I went to Zimbabwe specifically because I'd spent time away and I was on a, one would call a spiritual journey and I wanted to figure myself out outside of uh, European context, uh, European context in terms of spirituality and, and I was trying to, I guess, find myself in an environment that is familiar but yet not familiar and I arrived, I went to Zimbabwe with this idea that I would uh, enlighten. <laughs> I know it sounds, it's an ego, egotistical thing to have sort of thought I would be able to do right at that age or even in general um, and I wanted to sort of like tell them about my story and my experiences as a lesbian woman and bringing that into that environment. Uh, but that's a romantic idea. I mean, you can't just go into a space where there's been history, histories uh, and expect them to 
sort of accept that. So uh, it was a bit naive for me to do that. And um, so instead of me, um, instead of me trying to teach or, or, or showcase who I am, I actually put myself in the background a bit uh, during my time at the residency in Zimbabwe. And I allowed myself to learn from them. Um, and at the time I was staying with a spiritual medium who is, uh, who lives with the, the Chikon Zero, I never know how to say that. Maybe before we talk about that, I will just clarify this, uh, this place, this artist, this artist community really, where you were staying in Zimbanete. It's both a sort of artist-run space, workshop, and also a spiritual community. So this, this medium was also, if I'm not wrong, the gallery manager, so to speak, not gallery, but the person taking care of, of the artist in that environment, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, so mm. the spiritual medium would be, was also part of the residency program, mm. and uh, through him, he would tell you a bit more about Shona history and, um, how the West came and did what it did. But I don't want to get into that. But so I actually allowed myself to learn from them. And through that, I then decided to create this body of, I mean, I had the shows before that, but then I think when we had a conversation with you and Alessio about Gaswork show and uh, bringing back color into the work because I was going towards the direction where I was going to paint, um, I was going to make monochrome works and I decided that with you guys, I, I decided that maybe it isn't the right time to do that and I then, yeah, you guys encouraged me to continue with the color work and I used my experience in Zimbanete to sort of work on a series of, a body of work that would be part of the Gasworks show that's currently showing now. I think we'll go back to that a little later, talking a little bit more specifically about the changes that have kind of taken place in, in your production over the last years and maybe how you relate to those challenges as a painter as well. But just before going back to, to Zimbanete and these ideas of homecoming and so forth, maybe we'll just uh, uh, kind of say in relation to what uh, Violet was just saying, that uh, for me and for Alessio, the director of Gasworks, has been kind of a, a honor and really, really, really interesting process to be able to accompany Violet from an early stage in the production of this body of work. And something that we were talking about and to which Violet was just referring is this idea of probably when you see images in the slideshow of the earlier work, specifically the paintings that Violet was producing in 2015, 2016, and they are kind of characterized, I would say, by a very, very, very bold, vibrant use of color. And a palette, I would say, maybe we can talk about that later as well, like the painters that have influenced Violet and how do you relate to those traditions. But I remember you were saying, not long ago in a kind of private conversation that pop art is something that kind of, even if it's not evident at all in some of your paintings, you relate it too strongly as a kind of uh, a young painter in the process of, 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 of maturing, no? technically. And somehow that palette that I intuitively relate to West Coast painting, like this kind of mix of, say, Thing with light pistachio, with banana yellow, that very, very peculiar and vibrant use of color uh, was very characteristic, I think, of, of your early work. And then some very, very interesting kind of uh, 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 challenges, I think, that you put yourself as a painter in terms of how to keep current, no? in relation to conversations we've had, how to keep on track with uh, technological advancement and the influence of online visual culture on your work, which is something that I would also like to talk a little bit more later. In the most recent work before the Gas Wars exhibition, I think you were dealing with those questions in a very interesting way. And it was, I think, very, very enlightening for, for me and for Alessio to be able to discuss which aspects have been gained in those, in those challenges, no? Uh, from the perspective of, of a painter that is questioning herself how to keep producing new work, how to keep current, but also which aspects maybe 
were really, really strong and powerful in the earlier body of work and could be kind of recovered in an even bolder way, which I think as, 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 as one of the people working in this exhibition, I feel kind of extremely, extremely glad of how uh, the work you've produced, I think, kind of has the ability to gather both sides, to kind of bring back this boldness and this very, very powerful presence of the body and black bodies specifically, but also the complexity and the layering of some of your most recent works before the show. I'm thinking of the Venice paintings, for example. Yeah. Maybe something um, that I would like to ask you as well is this relationship to digital images. Uh, some of the people in the audience might be aware and some might be not, that maybe an aspect in Violet's practice that can go easily unnoticed unless you know about it, but is actually very much constitutive of your work, is how you archive images, which in some cases is images that you take, especially in the last show. In some cases is images that you collect from old family books, uh, photo books, mm. and very, very, very often is images that you have borrowed online from Tumblr accounts, Instagram accounts, even I think in your earliest work, porn sites. And this relationship, this arranging images, archiving them, layering them digital, uh, digitally in the form of collages, and then painting them changes the nature of those images. And for a lot of the audience of your work, I think it can go on notice that a lot of the work that happens in Violet's paintings takes place actually before you actually yeah. confront the canvas. Uh, the, the, in terms of creating an image or painting, final painting, that is constructed uh, within two weeks or a week, uh, depending on the scale of the work. But I actually spend much more time behind the behind paint. So I am I am making collages beforehand, and. Then after the collages, I then put them on this uh, architectural architecture um, app that then informed me on what size would be best for me to uh, make the image. And then from then on, I order canvas, and then the canvas is, uh, is a specific size that fits the collage, and then I project that onto the canvas once it has arrived and then I paint from that. So the process is um, quite methodical and I take a lot of time before I, I, do, I, I don't paint out of, it's not a spontaneous thing, it's all planned and yeah, I think that's what you're trying to point at. That yeah, absolutely. Process. Maybe two, two aspects of that that I would like also to ask you about. One of them, obviously, is what happens in that translation from the digital collage to the painting. But maybe even before that, something that I think is hugely interesting is how you compositionally alter those images when developing the digital collages. Sometimes you crop them, sometimes you layer them, sometimes you invert colors, and a series of things happen there. Something that strikes me and I think it's been pointed out by other people that has responded to your show. I remember one of the people that we invited to Gasworks to respond to Viola's exhibition is a writer and poet, Belinda Zawi, and she got kind of a, sp a sneak preview of the exhibition before it opened. And while looking at this painting specifically, which is called With All Your Friends, the one that you saw just before, she was uh, telling me, uh, as a person born in Zimbabwe, she was saying, that's a painting that I kind of feel an intimacy and familiarity with. She was kind of saying that most, most children from the generation born in that context have at least one family picture that looks like that. Yeah. And there's a, I think there's an element of intimacy and proximity and familiarity in a lot of the images you choose. Even for someone who doesn't share that background, there's an immediate feel and sense of intimacy. But at the same time, something that is interesting, and I think it's in contrast in all your work, is also I would say like a process of distancing or estranging those images. There's like a contrast between intimacy and proximity and familiarity and an exercise of almost kind of being foreign to them and technically layering them in such a way that suddenly they are abstracted from the original context so that they don't look anymore like images kind of proceeding specifically from 
Zimbabwe, Harare, yeah. whatever, but as something more abstract. Yeah, I mean, there's an element of uh, trying to create a fictional family within the work, and I guess that has to do with being displaced and not having a uh, close family in proximity. So we mostly stay in touch uh, via WhatsApp and Facebook, but mainly WhatsApp groups, right? I, I think it's a very African diasporian thing that we all kind of uh, go through. And, and through that, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it's, uh, I'm intentionally trying to replicate that, but it, it's just something that comes out and it happens. Mm -hmm. um, and so this detachment with even my family because of this distance is the same detachment that I have with <clears throat> almost every relationship that I've had uh, personally. I've have had um, online relationships more than I have had. Uh, okay, that's a lie. But <laughs> I've had um, very close, intimate relationships with people uh, through online format mm. and not real. Mm. It hasn't been uh, physical. Um, and I don't know what that is, but mm. those are the things that sort of come out within the work. Mm. And I'm creating fictional narratives around these images I archive and find. Mm. And Which I guess, um, like from my perspective, it obviously kind of immediately talks about your di diasporic background. But also there's something kind of highly generational and zeitgeist about it in a way. I, I, uh, we, one day we were kind of joking that somehow, even though no one could, would maybe tell by looking at the canvases themselves, it's a very post-internet practice. It's the practice of someone born and raised within global circulation of information and images and how our identities, and I guess even more so in the case of people with a diasporic background, but identities in general, subjectivities built on those online communications and how you were talking one day, remember, of how, especially like for teenagers, teenagers uh, nowadays, gathering images in a Tumblr account yeah. is like building one's own identity, no? It's like yeah. a collection of images that in the end, it's you somehow. Yeah, I mean, that's mm. pretty much where I grew up um, on Tumblr. Uh, although I had friends outside of that in, mm. in reality, in, in real life, but I spent most of my time on Tumblr creating fictional mm. uh, personas, mm. and 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 I think everyone was doing that. Mm. I don't know how Tumblr is like now. I have I don't use it as much, um, but then there's also Instagram, and so some of the works that were at that that are sh being shown at Gasworks. Mm. Uh, Specifically, the painting that is uh, the, the installation that is uh, titled Sp "Speaking, Speaking in, tongues. in Tongues." Yeah, <laughs> "Speaking in Tongues" mm. uh, has the same format that Instagram mm. has, and through those, I guess the scale kind of shows that. But then, the images in the the paintings themselves are an experience that I had at Zimbabwe, going back to Zimbabwe, and then I was trying to showcase that experience. And it's the same way that you would showcase uh, uh, an experience that you have I don't know, on a holiday and then you just mm -hmm. show that on Instagram. So For me that series, something that strikes me is that somehow, from my perspective at least, it talks also about how we built our identities with very small pieces of a wide range of things. Like, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but in that series, there's images that have a wildly different kind of uh, precedence, no? Yeah. There's like from images of Shona objects and sculptures that I think you told me you had photocopied from books and kind of reproduced to photographs that I think you took in Zimbabwe and silk screen and then painted on top mm -hmm. and kind of uh, altered to images that you found online and like this wide variety of images that somehow are part of who we are or who you are in that case. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why you'd, you'd um, post something on, on your Instagram mm -hmm. account. It's because you have taken on that uh, specific moment or whatever mm. identity and you've made yours. Mm. So it's the same way that, uh, that's the same way that I was working, mm. same thoughts that I was 
mm. thinking of mm. when I was making that mm. body of work. I was wondering as well to what extent the choice of images, which is very diverse and, and kind of shows a complexity and, and kind of the many different backgrounds and lineages that belong to a person, basically, also has to do with something that um, the other day, kind of, you were saying a conversation, I think you also mentioned it in, in the in conversation event with Michael Armitage a few weeks ago at Gasworks, and maybe I will let you to develop as well if, if you feel like it, which was this idea that on the one hand, another tension or, or kind of contradiction, conflict, whatever you may call it in your work, which was that uh, on the one hand you were saying you felt very much compelled to speak to paint from your point of view, which is that of a black body, of a lesbian woman, and so forth. But on the other hand, uh, you were stressing how important it was for you that your paintings and your persona were read also beyond politics, beyond a kind of given identity, mm. and beyond that burden of, of representing a particular community of group, and how identity in general, and yours in particular, I guess, has this complexity, this layering, this kind of wide diversity that cannot be just summarized with this or that given identity, and how to deal with that painterly, you were saying, was something that kind of drives you as well, no? Yeah, it's easy to just then box, uh, to talk about my, uh, I just find that it's very easy for me to make work about being a lesbian, make work about being a black woman. Um, and I think there are much, uh, there are artists that I really respect that are able to really make that work Oh. as profound as it should as it should be right um, and I don't I just don't think that it's a good idea to box um, the work in a certain narrative mm. because when I'm painting I am, I'm not necessarily making work that is I'm not thinking mm. oh here I am a black woman lesbian woman painting mm. I'm, I mean I'm listening to a different sort of podcasts. Um, so the work is being informed by various narratives and ideas that isn't necessarily uh, stuck in uh, what one would call core identity politics. Mm. And I, in particular, the work that I did for Venice, mm. while I was making that, there's more of a spiritual element to that mm. than there is of my Mm. given identity, right? Mm. If I, before you follow on, if I can refer specifically to one of the paintings you were showing at Venice, uh, when meeting at your studio in the process of painting it, I think you were talking about how, on the one hand, the image of this series of, of, of young men, kind of one arm against each other, holding each other, how the image had a very specific historical index, like historical procedure, yeah. and it was specifically referring to a series of events that you wanted somehow to index, but at the same time, you were kind of quite concerned about what elements to highlight and which elements to block so that that became something else, like an icon of maybe friendship, solidarity, a way of relating to each other that spoke beyond the original image and the, beyond the original intention of the image. Yeah. Again, it's making uh, very painful histories fic uh, um, fictional mm. um, and taking them the way that I would take any other image. So as, as much as that image is a very uh, painful time in history for Shona uh, tribe or Zimbabwean mm. people, me then switching the context and saying that, well, I've now freed them. So in, instead of them having been put in that link mm. as, a, as a way to, I don't, the, I don't know how, the, but they might have been mm. put there because of, I don't know the story, but I, I saw that image more as a way that they were holding each other, right? They were mm. supporting one another. But at the same time, I was responding to um, what Rafael Chikukwa mm. had, he had given us a text to read for... He text. was the curator of the pavilion for those who are in yeah, our... And he had given us a text to read for, the, for, for us to respond mm. towards the Venice exhibition. And I, 
Yeah, and, and I, I read that text and I took a line from there that spoke about the spiritual drought. Mm. And instead of seeing it as a, instead of reading that text as, okay, it was speaking about Zimbabwe, I kind of looked at it globally. Mm. And I was thinking more of how um, in the West there isn't much of uh, God talk, for example, mm. that's frowned upon as much as I'm, mm. I'm concerned. Mm. Um, and I was very interested in how um, we could have, I could relate to sort of uh, the spiritual narrative of Jesus and, mm. yeah. <laughs> Maybe, do you want to develop a little bit more on, on, on this question of spirituality, which is something you refer to uh, quite often, and I think it, it might come as unexpected for many people looking at your campuses, how I think that often when you've been asked about the politics of your work, you've stressed how both the focus on the painterly and your relationship to painterly traditions and the idea of painting itself and that kind of question of spirituality, which I guess also relates to the Shona ancestry and so forth, it's actually even more present in, in, in most of your work than the kind of, say, political layers. And I wonder if you want to say a little bit something more about that, like how does your production as a painter relate to a quest for kind of reconnecting to a certain spirituality? Or It's a difficult one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. It is, and, and, and I've gone back to school, I guess. Mm. Um, and those are the questions that I'm bringing up within conversations that I'm having with uh, my tutors and, and that. Mm. I find that it's a very difficult question. Mm. I'm only, uh, uh, I'm, I'm young, <laughs> I'm 26. And those are questions that I cannot just blatantly answer sure. and say, I know this, I know this. Mm. The work is as new to me as it is to everyone else. Mm. That makes sense. Mm. I guess just remembering bits of conversations we've had in the past, you've talked also about how when you are kind of layering a college and then painting it, I, like a few days ago I was asking you, what, what does it change or what's the translation do to the image or, or why, even, why even painting it? Which is something that a group of students the other day was, was visiting the exhibition and they posed this kind of harsh and naive question, which I think it's actually a really interesting question. Like after she's layered those images and so forth, why does she paint them? And it's something it's the labor, that- yeah. I've said this, like it's, it's the labor that goes into making a painting mm. that is intriguing to me. That mm. I, I much enjoy making the work than simply um, show, showing a collage mm. that I've done yeah. digitally. And I don't know, I guess it has to do with being Shona and mm. being uh, well, very industrious. Yeah. And I guess the reason I was bringing um, that back now is because when, when I asked you the other day, you were also saying something along the lines of the image doesn't really have a meaning or doesn't have a meaning for me until I paint it. Like painting it is yeah. also the way to kind of look for the meaningful, like look for the significance that like, giving some kind of weight or meaningfulness to an image. And I was wondering if that has also to do with this idea of a quest for spirituality, if, if the labor put into the painting is also a way to make those images value or have a kind of significance in your life. Mm. I mean, I look forward to the time when I'm much um, older and I can read these paintings as sort of a diary. Mm. Uh, and kind of like see why I was make why I'm making them and what what does it really mean beyond I guess what I would say now. I, I, I just don't believe that whatever I say will be the exact meaning. I think that the meaning continues uh, to change over time mm. to me anyway. Sure. And um, yeah, I'm taking a bit of time to really spend time with the work. I'll be looking at it digitally, I won't, cause, but I, I'm, spending, I'm gonna be spending a lot of time looking at the work and trying to uncover why I've done certain things. Because you kind of have to realize that it's only been um, three years and, mm. and there is a body of work, but. Mm. 
You've done like a crazy amount of work in little time. Yeah. Yes, but the, uh, there needs, I think there needs to be time to sort of read that work mm, properly. Sure. Yeah. Talking about time and, and the time one commits to the painting and so forth, something else, I mean, don't want to put kind of words in your mouth, but something else that I, I think I remember from those conversations and also from the um, conversation you had with Michael Armitage, at some point you were talking about this idea of committing time to the work, like painting, I thought it was very interesting. You were kind of saying that somehow a kind of intrinsic aspect of the painterly process, let's say, is this idea of putting care and labor and time and commitment into an image. And I thought it was very interesting in a time, especially coming from someone as young as you are and kind of raised on the age of the internet and so forth, where images have very little value and they circulate globally very, very quick. Yeah. And we are kind of desensitized to images. Like in the 1960s, if a photojournalist published an image of a war, that image would travel the world very quickly and have a very strong impact on consciousness everywhere. But nowadays, we are kind of inundated, flood, flooded with images and kind of desensitized to them. They are kind of very poor, very invaluable, very and it's I've never. The, uh, it's the same way that I feel when I look. It, I think it is also translated to mm. the images that I find in my family albums. Mm. So the way that I look at Instagram images have also that same way of looking has mm. flowed into looking at archival images. It has flowed into looking at paintings and artworks um, and going to galleries. And there isn't an, an attachment mm. to. The, the meaning of the work, or and I don't know if it's me or if it's everyone, mm. Um, mm. but there is a detachment to, to work, and I don't know if there's a. I don't know why people go to galleries, mm. for example, yeah. anymore. Mm. Um, and I quite like what Alain de, de Poton says mm -hmm. about uh, going to making galleries into cathedrals, for mm, example. Mm, mm. So, I mean, one of my dreams is to go to see the Fourth Court Chapel, mm. because that, that's how I view art or mm. painting. Mm. And that's what I'm trying to make, but mm. it's very hard to do that when it's, um, it's commercialized. Mm. I guess that's, yeah, I guess that's the point. I think what kind of struck me in that, in that moment of your conversation with Michael Armitage, which, because basically I had never thought of painting that way, is that many people in many different contexts ask what's the value or the sense of painting in the present moment. And somehow, in the context of that conversation, uh, how to put it, there was something about this idea of suddenly painting providing space to commit time and value to an image in a way we don't usually do in our everyday lives, to kind of bring back that value and that kind of, almost kind of loving care relationship to an image. Yeah. And yeah, which I guess also has something to do with the way you speak about spirituality, which has to do with kind of giving back value and relating to an image in a way that feels, I mean, literally spending a week or two or how much time you spend in depending kind of the large the, the dimension of the canvas, working through that image overnight often and kind of giving it a value through your own effort. Mm. And I thought it was very interesting to thought to think of painting in that way in this particular kind of context of online culture. Mm. Yeah, because it, it, it slows down the so the the, the, the it's guy like slow food. <laughs> the guy who came to your um, to who did the you gave a tour mm. and one of the students mm. said mm. The one, why bother paint mm. if you already have the image mm. in collage and I guess that has to do again with well it slows down the pace of mm. uh, making a work because sure. it's much easier I could, you could churn out <laughs> uh, 20 mm. collages which are really are really stunning they, they are really that's what happens collages. right mm. but then um, yeah. it slows down the pace because then mm. you have enough time to really and I, and I just enjoy uh, sort of beating sure. uh, not beating like, I, I can't find the right word English is not my first language it's like <laughs> st 
struggling with the image somehow? Has it to yeah, do struggling that? with the image and um, overcoming technology. Yeah. So yes, the collage can be made within a, within uh, an hour, yeah. but the painting itself will take mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And I like that challenge. And things also happen when you are painting that collage. No, there's, I mean, I. Correct me if I'm wrong in that particular case, but in the case of the boy with a dove, which we, 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 we just saw kind of a minute ago, I think originally the image was a chicken, isn't it? And yeah, the original, yeah, was a chicken. And sometimes you block background. Sometimes that also happens already in the digital collage. But there's a series of things that happen in the translation. I don't know to what extent intuitively or, 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 or in some cases maybe more planned. Mm. But I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit about what does it happen when you are taking the original digital collage and then translating it into a completely different medium. That uh, the, the blocking out of color. So, for example, having um, like really bright bright backgrounds came from me looking at Tumblr images. Mm -hmm. So there was a moment in time when when I was on Tumblr anyway. The, there were all of a sudden black models, really dark skinned models, and um, and they would be behind really bright backgrounds, and I thought that was that that was amazing. I, I loved that, and I wanted to use that within my paintings, and and then um, and so I've been I've been using that method so using a dark-skinned person, and then I, before that I was using pornographic images, mm. which I still go back to, mm. but I just haven't publicized it, and then. Can I interrupt you here and just ask, I just thought about it, what, to what extent does it change your relationship to those images while you're painting them, or your attitude, or I don't know, the way you encounter them as a painter? depending on whether, because they are radically different kind of images, like say, an old nostalgic image in a family photo album, uh, still frame source from a porn site, uh, the picture of a model borrowed from someone else's Instagram. They belong kind of emotionally even, and in terms of your proximity to those images, they belong to radically different universes. And I wonder, also dealing with questions of kind of responsibility and, 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 and proximity, but how does, how does your relationship to those images change depending, or even with the last show in, in, at Gasworks, which I think it's the first one in which you are also using images that you photograph yourself. Mm. And what, what, what does it change in your practice? What does it bring new or what? What does it bring? Me using images that I've found? I guess the question would be, does your position as a painter change depending on the nature of the image? Do you deal, do you kind of, do you deal in the same way with an image that comes from your direct nuclear family to an image of someone in your family that you have barely known no. to an image source from the internet? Yeah, there's no difference. Um, and this is why I had a problem with me going back to after I was make, when I was making the collages for Gasworks, one of my problems was finding out that me having gone there wasn't what I had intended for. So I, I went there in order for me to connect with, the peop with people, mm. but actually I ended up being more of a tourist, mm. and I was taking photographs for the sake of coming back and showcasing it. And there was something very, <laughs> I felt really wrong for having done that. And I, when I think back about the experience, I think, well, what did I really learn? Because I, I, I often am blank, because I was so busy um, trying to be an artist and <laughs> taking photographs. I guess that's images. also a piece of knowledge to get from the trip, isn't it? Like old school psychoanalysts used to say that uh, kind of the, the marker that you have gone through the therapy is that you realize there's nothing to learn from that person. Mm -hmm. Like you don't need a psychotherapist. And I guess like going there and realizing that maybe some of those assumptions or wishes might have been romantic or kind of naive or that's a lot to learn yeah. from a trip as well, no? Yeah. 
I guess that's part of what you were also processing kind of painterly in that exhibition, this going back and maybe not necessarily feeling a stronger sense of belonging there than you feel here, no? Or, or, or yeah, because then I thought maybe going back would also ignite my moving there mm. for good um, or moving to South Africa because I also have family in South Africa. Mm. But then I realized it's a... Uh, I live digitally, so my life is on a digital platform, and that's where most of my, I, necessarily, I don't have to necessarily move there physically. Um, and that was another realization. So instead of me finding out about Shona's spirituality, it was another realization of you are actually a global child, and that's where you belong, I guess. Maybe, I don't know if people has kind of thoughts, ideas that they want to share. Maybe it's a good time to open up also the conversation to the audience and, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I had uh, two questions. I, I wanted to hear a little bit. Uh, Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the relationship between the potted plants and the potted plants. I wanted to ask you about the potted plants. Uh, ask if you could talk a little bit about that that motif which uh, we see in several of your works and and I also wanted to hear you talk a little bit about um, how your figures relate to the backgrounds um, and I think m maybe the answer relates or m maybe your thoughts on that might relate to what Sabal was uh, 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 asking, you know, in, in, in relation to your, your sources and how you transform them. I'm, and I'm asking partly because it seems that you're not just painting figures on, pre, uh, on previously painted backgrounds. It seems they, the two come together and the areas between the figures or the, the, the places where the figure and background meet are often uh, very busy. There's a lot going on in those areas in your painting. Where, where figure meets background, and they press against each other in really interesting and rich ways. So I, I was wondering if you could um, talk to one or perhaps both of those questions. So the first question was... Um, uh, potted plants. Potted plants. Potted plants, right. Um, when I first encountered contemporary art, so it was me looking at people like Koz and uh, Takashi Murakami, as well as uh, Yu Minjun. And they all had what you would say a motif, right? And that uh, sort of stuck with me. And I had, uh, in my early paintings, I had these figures with banana heads, banana horns. And um, <laughs> I decided to let that go, but I couldn't let go of the idea of a motif. And so that stuck with me, and I've been including like this banana plant within my work. Um, not only the banana plant, but other sort of plants. But it has turned into um, yeah, it has turned into something that I can't quite let go of. And I know there was a painting that I did where it's titled "Antenna to the Ancestors." where I use the same motif of the plant. And in the background, there are, there are Shona sculptures that I took from textbooks. And that painting had more spiritual underlinings. So I think perhaps it has to do with that at this time, that's all I have. And the um, other question had to do with um, So when I'm making the paintings, it's usually, like I've said, there's a methodological way. I, uh, the, the background usually comes first, and um, the, everything is added. So the collage, if I would show you a collage, it looks exactly as the actual painting. 
So everything, none of the marks are uh, um, spontaneous. They're all planned. So in this painting, everything that you see here has been planned. The yellow uh, part over here is all planned. Um, Apart from sometimes I improvise, sorry, sometimes I I change the the. It's in, intuitive, so I decided I decided I don't want to paint the bird entirely, and I thought it was good enough to leave it there, um, rather than sort of like put in a lot of detail. Maybe expanding on his question, something that is also interesting about the backgrounds, I think, and which. I think I would never have thought until kind of actually engaging in conversation with you, but once you talk about it, it's evident. It's like your interest in abstract painting. And in figures like Robert Rauschenberg, which wouldn't be one of the painters that I would first think of while looking at your paintings, but once you know those backgrounds, and specifically what I think you were referring to, that clash in between the figures of the background, I took that's something that kind of, it's very intriguing for me and also very interesting. I don't know if you want to say anything about your relationship to abstraction, which is, yeah. Yeah, um, early, early, early um, abstraction work that I saw was Basquiat. And, and then I went to a Rauschenberg exhibition in 2017, because he had a retrospect at the Tate. And, it all clicked, so that's when I began to sort of like build up the language within the paint that would work with what I'm trying to say. So, and I do look at a lot of um, abstract, abstract painters. Um, um, yeah. Something that is interesting to me as well, and it's another of those tensions that I think kind of mobilize your work in a very interesting way, is this idea that on the one hand, you are thinking about abstraction and that way of kind of negotiating the background in your paintings and so forth, and there's kind of a very rhythmic quality to, to the backgrounds and the color use. But at the same time, as you were just saying, it's very planned. It's almost like a Baroque painting would stage their figures, use optical devices, all these layers of information and sketches that go before the painting is actually painted. Yep. And in your case, it's the archiving the images, the collecting them, the putting them together. In some cases, especially in the work you were producing about a year ago, in which like there's multiple layers overlaid, and all those decisions come before you actually paint in a very, very, very calculated manner, mm. which is kind of, again, an interesting tension in between what looks gestural and what it's actually gestural. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you have to. Yes, it needs to be done well in order for it to not look mm. as though it's been a calculation of events. Mm. So, so you spoke about, maybe, cool, nice. Can I check on two? I can, I can, I can, I can, I can, yeah, I can talk. <laughs> um, you spoke about, I want to hear, you said, you mentioned about Tumblr and sort of your kind of, inspiration of using, of how you kind of looked at Tumblr and the backgrounds for that. Mm -hmm. you, you spoke a little bit about pornographic images. Could you elaborate on how you got from Tumblr to that, and just the process, and you said that you were drawing pornographic images first, and then you kind of took a journey into something else. Can you just talk, talk me through that? I was really interested. Uh, so the pornographic images came from me not having enough physical friends yeah. <laughs> that could model for me. Because <laughs> I was interested, I was uh, looking at, uh, I was discovering gender, so that also happened through Tumblr. Um, so gender, questioning gender, and questioning sexualities, and, and at the time when I was 19, that was pretty, it's a hot topic, I and mean, people were, Everyone you meet on Tumblr either identified as non-binary or um, genderqueer. And so at that time, I wanted to make work about that. And my source material had to be the nude body for some reason. And so I was looking at a lot of uh, 
pornographic nudes, mostly vintage, because of the quality of uh, the poses. And <laughs> so that, that, that's how it happened. And in 2017, I didn't want to make work about that. Um, so I had a solo show at Taiwan Gallery, and I made, that's when I started using uh, archival imagery from my family album. So that's how that journey happened. So then you turned into research yourself, instead of searching your sexuality, you started searching yeah, your identity. The, yeah, I started to expand a bit more. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, sexuality could be your identity as well, but mm -hmm. it started to expand beyond that. And I think now it's also, um, me looking into shorter sculpture is a way for me to expand that identity into uh, something that's not uh, what you're seeing right now, right? Uh, much more a uh, uh, spiritual identity. I'm not really sure how <laughs> how that would how that's gonna turn out, but yeah. Also, maybe a link between both moments is that at that stage you had also painted yourself both as a boy and as a girl, no? which has also to do with this idea of like both questions about sexuality, yeah. but also so I painted who I am. No? Yeah, yeah. So it started off with questioning the identity of your, your sexuality, yeah. body, and... Like, both questions make me think of another, which I never asked you, which is in all those early paintings, there's a lot of, you were talking before about bananas, there's a lot of fruit. And I always assumed, because of the history of fruit of, in paintings, that they kind of stand it for sex and sh sensuality and so forth. Is that the case? Is that why they... Yeah, they were, it was the case. Um, and looking at, like, the history of uh, uh, gay language, Mm. or LGBT mm. language and where the uh, gay men would call themselves between each other, fruitcake, and mm. so that had to do with like a play, a play of that. Mm. Yeah. Play with words. Play with words, yeah. Sorry, that doesn't really work. We can try again, but I think it would be good. Ah, sure. Do you mind? Just temporarily. <laughs> Um, when I was going to see your works at Gasworks, um, one of the descriptions that someone told me on the way there was that it was about the black body. And I think in like watching your interview online and you said that as, as a black body, a lot of times political um, motivations are put onto your work or, or readings. And also online, a lot of the literature um, relates your work to the black body or describes it about the black body. Is that something that you describe for the work or you feel like so that's something that has been put on your work by other people? I feel like I had to say it because otherwise uh, there's the question, the question marks around the work. Um, and it's strange because there isn't, you don't have to, I don't, you can clearly see that it is about the black body, but I guess saying it cements it in a way. Um, and I do feel that's something that artists, uh, black artists in particular, uh, have a pressure to uh, I have to say that, but I agree with it, yes, it is about the black body. Um, but I'm questioning why I have to state that. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, you talked about finding your home on a digital platform. And that idea, is, idea seems really fascinating to me because I always associated home with like a physical place. Um, and did you find that realization like stabilizing or was it destabilizing to think of your home as a digital platform? I think it's much more, sta it stabilized me because um, I like the idea of being a nomad as well. So moving yeah. around, uh, visiting this family. I, I, as much as I find it to be, um, I find that it's, when I see people like Mugabe, or I, I realize that of course they, what happened in Zimbabwe, for example, pulled families apart. But at the same time, I see it as a gift to explore other cultures, and you can do that. You can do that digitally, but 
I like the idea that I can always move to Cape South Africa. I can go to Cape Town and visit. I can go to um, uh, Canada and visit my cousin who lives there. I can go to China and see my family members who live there as well. I think there's a beauty in that um, move in, in the movement of people, although it's painful when it has pulled people apart. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, I think I think so. <laughs> I think I, mean, I think it's a question that doesn't really have an answer. Right. Yeah. Yes. Someone wants to ask a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, going back to the idea of the flower of the flower pots and having the banana tree in it, it's it's kind of funny because you usually see the banana plant or the plantain plant they both look similar. You see them in the natural like state in the soil, but now when you put them in, into the flower pot, the, the pot sort of, sort of assumes it, the plant into, into that sense of like something precious or something beautiful or something you nurture mm. out, of, out of the wild or you bring home, becomes a homely plant. But after you talked about it in connection with sexuality, you know, it gave me a little bit of understanding to it now. But I'd like you to, you know, explain further about the pot, the idea of putting the plant into the pot again. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I didn't necessarily put the uh, the plant in the pot, so I use a low found image, and uh, through me finding this found photo uh, images, the plant have just happened to be, and it's only this one image that I have in my uh, collected uh, photos of the banana plant. So it wasn't an intentional um, idea for me to put, but it's an interesting, uh, I'll look into that. It's an interesting uh, observation that I decided to keep it in, 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 in that context of it being sort of like preserved in this pot. He wants to... <laughs> um, that big, um, image there, Newtown, because you speak about um, taking collages and slowing the process of making the work by paint, physically painting them. So there's, when you look at that, there's instances where you take the actual picture as it is, and I don't know what, what goes on there. Do you print it onto your canvas and then paint? Um, do you get what I'm saying? Yes. And then, so uh, yeah, so that's one. And this one as well is where you, you've got a couple of images where you have scribblings on female figures. And the, 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 the male figure in one, this one looks joyous and, and uh, the other one looks a bit distant and somewhat indifferent. I'm kind of intrigued by that sort of partial motif and the pieces that have got that thing going on in them. Again, um, the scribbling of faces has to do with uh, being dramatic, so creating drama within a painting, creating a narrative. It could be fictional, it could be true, but um, I mean, that's, I don't want to explain further into why I have uh, particularly done that to, to the female figure. I've done that in a previous painting titled um, Family Portrait. And in that, I scribbled my little brother, and I wouldn't, I don't want to go into further details of why I did that, but it's to create like this tension and drama within a painting. And, um, <clears throat> and then you said? You kind of, uh, how you, you choose certain, you reproduce certain collages as they are, and then, so I'm intrigued, what do you do? Do you first print them out on the canvas, or do you paint the actual, and then print them on later? It's all done um, through layering. So the collage really informs me on what will go on first and what will go on last. So in this particular painting, what came on first was the, um, the pink around the border and then um, the silk screen. And then, and then I painted the, back, the green background. And then the silk screen came after again of the photograph, and then I painted the figures. So there's um, 
a process that goes that I go through with each painting, depending on what the collage looks like. You mentioned uh, spirit mediums several times. Could you speak a bit more about how that aspect informs your work, please? I mentioned spirit mediums uh, because I was staying with a spiritual medium uh, during my time at Zimbanete and I had a residency. And I was not aware that they would have a spiritual medium. I just knew that I'm going to go there and they would know a bit more history about Zimbabwe <clears throat> and Shona people and their history. And actually the spiritual medium stays in the same compound and we, he would, he was the one informing me more about the history. And then um, Chico, Sekuri Chico was informing me more on silk screening and printmaking. So they work together. So that's why I mentioned uh, spiritual media. Something I think we didn't mention is that one of the paintings is this, this medium, is this person. Is the it's assistant. Like ah, yeah, okay. he's the assistant of the, assistant. the spiritual, of the medium. Okay. So it's, the painting is titled Medicine Man. Medicine Man. So that's, that was the assistant who, um, he would collect herbs and help the spiritual medium do his work. <clears throat> you go, okay, well, one last question, and then we can move to the reception, and you can still talk to the artists afterwards. Hi, thank you very much for um, talking about your work and um, giving me a chance to actually see your work. Um, I just wanted to know if you thought that the way we go to the gallery and see your work is the best environment for your um, paintings, if perhaps you wanted us to maybe engage with it in a slightly different way, apart from being, you know, in a square box with white walls. Is, is there an ideal, do you have an ideal? deal um, for us to engage with your work? I don't have an ideal for way to engage with my work in particular, but I think every artist works. I think there needs to be a bit more uh, care into uh, viewing works. I, uh, uh, maybe I'm just a bit, being a bit of a romantic, but um, I'd like there to be projects or uh, programs that and um, you actually have to sit with the work for a much longer time. So I think it's easy to just come into a gallery and take a picture and just say you were there, but were you there for the right reasons? Um, it's good to really experience the work, I think. That's a very nice conclusion. Thank you very much. Kudzana, Violet, and Sabel, thank you so much. Uh, it was a fascinating talk. Thank you for the audience for your very uh, interesting uh, questions. I would like to invite you to join us to the cafe now, and please come and join us uh, for a drink. Thank you. <laughs>